All right, we are thrilled to be joined by Austin FC striker Jossie Zardes. Jossie, thanks so much for doing this, man. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you guys for having me. Um, did, I'm guessing you you finished training not too long ago. Is that what you've been up to today? Yeah. So uh, we had training earlier. Uh, today was a windy day, so um, we kind of spent more time on the field than expected. But um, yeah, usually I'm home around two o'clock. <laughs> we saw you out out playing golf yesterday. Uh, you you looked the part, man. You you look like you've, you've been golfing before. Are you a golfer? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I like to golf, uh, but my golf game says otherwise. Uh, <laughs> it was funny, man, because I didn't get the memo. I thought everybody was gonna come in their golf gear, and I, <laughs> it was like it was like me and a, a handful of people had golf attire on, while everybody else had like just a jumpsuit on. I was like, oh no. <laughs> it looks like Hector. Hector was dressed for the game as well. Oh yeah, Hector always he's always prepared and always has style. <laughs> Jeremiah has actually played with. Hector I thought I was going to say, yeah, I had, the, I had a chance to play with Hector a couple months ago. Do you, have you do y'all play golf together very much? Oh yeah, all? yeah, man. Me and Hector, we we played golf in the past. Uh, what was that? Twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen, we played golf before, and then uh, this preseason we had an opportunity in Florida uh, to jump on the course at IMG and play. <laughs> nice, but he's good. He's good. How how are you compared to Hector? Hector carried uh, carried me a lot we were in the same yeah. we were playing like a scramble tournament and yeah he, uh, he looked okay. he looked apart you know when he hits the ball it goes a lot farther in in the general direction he wants it to and that does not always mm -hmm. happen when i do that yeah <laughs> he's consistent <laughs> yeah well i want to ask so you how's the family like settling in to austin you've got I'm, i've got i'm a dad of two kids you're a dad of four so mm -hmm. i imagine you're like twice as busy as me but how's that going yeah, no, man, they're, they're loving Texas. Um, you know, three of my kids are, are here at the moment. Um, my oldest daughter is still living in Denver. Um, she's finishing up her, her dance uh, season, I should say, because like they've been training all of last year and now they're finally competing the next uh, nine weeks. So she's still in Denver, but you know, my son, he's, he's at school with a couple of kids within the neighborhood. So he's loving it. Um, two of my younger kids go to all, spe all Spanish speaking school, you know, trying to become bilingual and uh, they're loving it. And, you know, they're they're so quick to to get out the car. Once I pull up to to the school, I'm like, man, they must be doing something right in there. <laughs> so but they're, they're 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 really having a good time out here. How is your Spanish, Jesse? Uh, it's, it's OK. Yo hablo poquito español, pero necesito más práctica. Yeah, so living in Los You're Angeles, all right. You're all right. I could speak it. Um, a bunch of my friends, um, you know, growing up, spoke Spanish, so I was around it and tried to speak it as much as possible. But um, living out in Columbus for a while, you kind of don't use it as much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? you'll get you'll get opportunities here. I mean, if nothing else, mm -hmm. with your with your attacking teammates, you can practice a lot there. <laughs> oh yeah, we we speak a lot uh, on the field and off the field. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to get to see you on an episode of Mate Convos at some point then? Have you seen that, them do that? I haven't seen it yet, no. <laughs> yeah, it's yes. like a little like chat show that uh, Maxi and Diego and, and Seba oh. all do. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sure I'm going to experience it this year. <laughs> it's pretty great. Uh, going back to your kids for a second, I saw a photo floating around of your oldest in an Austin FC jersey. Is he going to be in the academy now? Yeah, so he uh, he was trying out the past two to three weeks and uh and he made the team um which is amazing so uh he's he's one of the younger kids on the team but you know um he joined the academy and and made it and i'm excited about his little journey of becoming a better soccer player but more importantly you know his love for the game growing over the years so it's it's nice he's already uh i think they went down to or up to dallas last weekend uh, and, and played a couple games against FC Dallas and a couple of other clubs up there. And, and when he got back, I was like, Hey, how was it? And he, he enjoyed it. He thought it was fun and competitive. And, you know, that's all I ask as a parent that, you know, he just keep growing with the game and keep enjoying it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I was looking through players and I think you're the first player with kids old enough to even be in consideration mm -hmm. for the Academy. I think maybe there was some players with girls that would have been of the age, but you're, I think you ah. have the first sons that are old enough to be in that level so it's pretty cool wow. to see multiple generations in the system now yeah i didn't even, i didn't even think about that that's crazy to even think about like he's a part 
um, of the system. And man, I, I I joked with him the other day. I was like, "Hey, gee, you play you played an official game already before I have." <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you, you grew up in a big family yourself, didn't you? Yes, yes. Um, it was seven of us total, including my parents. Um, you know, five siblings. I was uh, I was the fourth child. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm so used to a big family. I loved it growing up. And even to this day, you know, we're all involved in a group chat. And we communicate within that group chat every single day. You know, whether it's good morning or um, what do you have up for today? Um, it, it's, it's amazing. So for me to have, you know, four kids uh, and a big family as well, I get to see now from a parent perspective of that upbringing, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's incredible. Did I hear somewhere correctly that your dad was a musician? Yeah. So he, uh, he played like percussion, you know, he played percussion. He's real uh, big into music, like, you know, love music. And, um, you know, earlier on, he's actually the one that that got me inspired to not only play the guitar because he brought me my first guitar, but also he was the one that kind of influenced me to have an ear for music as far as like different genres and different eras. And now like uh, as a hobby, I DJ. So it oh, allows nice. me, it allows me to, uh, you know, catch on to, to different, different music from different backgrounds and kind of sync them together. And, you know, that's all coming from him because growing up, around the house, we always had different types of music playing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is if you picked mm -hmm. up an instrument. So you play some guitar. Yeah, yeah, I, I play the guitar. Um, I've, I've played it like off and on since the seventh grade. You know, some, wow. sometimes I'm like playing and then a couple months go by, I'm like, I'm not playing. But now that my kids are older, um, I DJ as well. And that's been the fun one for them because uh, my daughter, my daughter, she plays the piano, and my son, I tried to get him into the guitar, but my youngest son, my, my two-year-old, this guy loves to DJ. I mean, oh, right. <laughs> yeah, he'll, gra he'll grab my hand and go to the DJ booth. He's like, DJ, DJ. So, <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, it's incredible because, like, he, he wears glasses. And so uh, his DJ name is uh, DJ I See You. So while he's DJ, <laughs> we're always like, DJ I See You. And he, he's amazing. That's <laughs> amazing. He's going to be the one with the ear. He's going to be the one with the ear for music next. <laughs> so this is, I know, tangentially family related, but most of our listeners will probably have heard the story about your hair at some point. Mm -hmm. And that you, you initially started dyeing it so that your grandparents could pick you out on TV when you were playing. Um, mm -hmm. so my wife has gotten into soccer because of Austin FC. She didn't really pay attention mm -hmm. to it. Like knew I was really into it, but, and would watch a game with me every once in a while, but she's really close with her grandmother who's actually still with us. And mm -hmm. I told, I, I told her about your hair one time when I think it was probably the national team playing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I told her the story about your hair and she was like, oh, that's amazing. And so like, <laughs> you're the first soccer player whose name she ever remembered. And oh, wow. you're like oh, one of her favorites. And so whenever she heard that you were coming to Austin, she was super excited. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. I know. Um, it, it, it's crazy because like the Mohawk was just supposed to stay, you know, maybe for a month or two. And here it is, man, on my 11th, my 11th season, I still have the same hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> would, would you ever consider going Verde for a few games? Ooh. Or has it got to uh, stay blonde? Yeah, I think I think I, I just keep it blonde because, man, I have it's a lot of guys on the team. You got you got Diego. He puts all kind of colors in his hair. Yeah. You got Seba. You you have uh you know Danny as well. These guys they like they love to mess around with the colors. So I'll let those guys you know put all the, the fancy colors in their hair and and I'll just stick to the basic. <laughs> stick to your roots. Stick to your roots. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's there's like a lot of flair and swagger in that group. You know, you got You may have to like step it up in terms of like outfits and hair and all those things. Oh yeah, you're right. Hey, I come in with my dad outfit, and you got these guys on the first day looking all fly. <laughs> yes, he'll grow on me. <laughs> That's good. Um, well, I don't think we need to like read back through your bio, but you know, 67 U.S. national team caps, 100 goals, close to 100 goals in MLS. Like, mm -hmm. you had obviously lots of options. So, like, why Austin? Yeah, um, for me, man, it, it was definitely a move that I communicated with my family as well, you know, because in the past, 
the decisions were like based on me, like, Hey, I want to go here and you guys cool coming with, but now that my kids are older, my family older, you know, I had a lot, a lot of dialogue with, uh, with my wife because, you know, not only am I uprooting and leaving, uh, a city it's also you know they're coming with me and they're of age to where like i'm kind of taking them away from their friends as well um so that was one key factor but then the 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 most important thing was the team man um i played under wolfie in columbus he was my strikers coach when greg burhalter was the head coach and you know i've worked with him in the past and i had i had the best year of my career um that 2018 season you know i, I believe i scored uh 19 official goals not counting um, a couple goals in, in different tournament play. And then not only that, the, the team is so structured in detail to where as a striker, you know exactly how you're going to score. Um, you know, I, I talked to a bunch of strikers within the league that play on other teams and, and they tell me like, gee, I go into games and I have no idea how I'm going to score. I don't even know if I'm going to get a shot. And I'm like, yeah, man, but here in Austin, there is a foundation to the style of play. And yes, through through the course of the game, things go away from that. But you know when a certain player gets the ball, what kind of runs to make because you know that's an option that he can pass or shoot, uh, collect a rebound. It, it's so many options for a striker. And for, for me, just having multiple opportunities in a game, you know, my eyes lit up when it was like Austin's interested. I was like, what? Like last year, I think they had one of the highest crossing uh, percentages out of all the teams within the league. So um, the type of striker I am, I, I love to be in the box. I love to to move around, blind, um, you know, and, and try to just get on the end of crosses and, and finish myself. So, you know, that was just something that just really pulled me into this direction. Oh, it, looking at like what Burhalter was doing in Columbus when you were there and what Wolf is asking of you now, does it feel familiar or has he he changed it up enough to where there's still quite a bit you're having to learn? Oh, man, there's always room for for growth and improvement, you know, constantly learning um, this. It, it's very it, it's very similar. But at the same time now, it's now uh, it's like enhanced to where there's more options now. You know, it's not just that one option. Now we have three variables um, going forward to where, OK, if that's not working, we can we can we can do this as opposed to in the past. Um, you know, if, if certain teams pick up on it, they'll play a certain formation, which will um, give us less opportunities, you know. So but with this one, it doesn't matter what formation the team is playing. Um, we'll still have numerous opportunities. And I'm trying to give you an answer that's not really giving out, you know, too much. Information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just we got in it. case, you know, some other people are watching this like, oh, they're doing this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to get you in trouble for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anybody, I know you haven't had a ton of practice yet, but uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned like guys who fire in crosses and, and connecting. Is there anybody that you've really like grown maybe a little bit of a relationship with in that way already? Yeah. So, man, uh, believe it or not, after training, uh, there's a there's a handful of a handful of guys that love to cross the ball after training, which is rare, you know, because um, on previous teams, a lot of the guys, they don't really want to stay outside and cross a lot of balls because, you know, that's draining on your body. But here, man, you have Nick Lima, you have John Gallagher, you have, you know, Z on the left. There's so many players that are willing after training to to go out and, and cross the ball. Like, hey, gee, you want some? I'm like, of course I want some, man. <laughs> like, if you guys are crossing the ball, I'm going to. I'm going to stay after training and, and start a, to, to get the kinks out now. So once season come around, I'll be prepared, you know. So it's a lot of those guys that are willing to stick around after training to, to, um, to you know, cross the ball just so I can start getting used to their service, their style, and what they tend to do, whether they're playing on the left or the right, if they like to cut back and cross or if they like the early one, um, you know, the hard, early, low ball with pace and power. Every player differs. And for me, the more reps I can get in training with those players, the better I can be. Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about is kind of like building that chemistry with mm -hmm. the other guys. Are, do you feel like you're starting to get there and learning some more um, as yeah. far as what, what tendencies they have and how it fits with your game? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the more, the more I train with them, I'm starting to understand it. Um, you got to consider, too, there's a lot of guys uh, during preseason. There's a lot of guys out there, and obviously as – Preseason starts to taper down. Also, the roster uh, starts to taper down, especially with us having, you know, the Austin two team around. So, you know, as the training sessions start to get closer, 
through our first game day, I'm finding myself, um, you know, really starting to understand certain player personnel that I'm playing alongside, you know, which players are looking for the nine as opposed to which players are looking out wide and crashing the box. So that's a big factor for me. What's it been like playing with Drew Ucy specifically? Like is Man. We, we've all seen that he's just like on another level. What does that mean for you playing next to him? Yeah, I, I agree with you, man. Uh, he, he sees the game so different. Um, I know when he gets the ball, it doesn't matter where I am on the field, he can find me. And it took me a while to understand that. But once I saw him do it more than, more than uh, a couple of training sessions, I was like, okay, he have, he have an incredible eye to where he's looking to, to, to play the striker. You know, he's looking, but he's also, he's coming full speed running. After he played me, he's running into a space and all I have to do is just find that open space because he'll, he'll find the ball, he'll get it, and he's constantly moving. He's so eager and willing to not only find me, but also he's eager and willing to score and get on the end of a cross. You know, because in the past on certain teams, sometimes I'll be the only guy in the box after I receive the ball from a 10 um, and then we play out wide. But with him, anytime he play me or play anybody else, he's crashing the box with me like he's right there with me. So um, he, he's a phenomenal player. And, and like, I'll agree with you that, you know, he's just on a different level. Yeah, it's always it's a thing we kind of joke about on the show that he's just like he'll pop up out of nowhere and mm -hmm. get on the ball or score but if you play that back he he was on the opposite side of the field plays a switch ball or plays it plays it centrally and if mm -hmm. you take your eye off of him you're just like oh the ball just fell to him and then but if you go back and actually watch his movement it's like oh no he mm -hmm. knew where it was going to end up the whole time somehow oh, but yeah. he did mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah and I, i'm seeing it i'm seeing it every day in training now you know <laughs> well we talked a little bit about so you, you you've played with Hector before you played for Josh before you played with Brad before too right in, in Columbus no or so no, uh, Brad, not, there, Brad, not there at the same time yeah he just left as I arrived okay gotcha I missed that on that so like who does it make it I'm assuming it does make it easier to like connect with the locker room and and, and get connected to people when you've got folks from your past who are involved already yeah oh yeah um it definitely makes it easier because they kind of they kind of give me the lay of the land, like things to do, things not to do, so I don't get fined. But also, um, you know, it, it makes it comfortable for myself as opposed to not knowing anyone. I know a couple guys that, you know, I could integrate with. But, man, other than that, all the other players, they've been so inviting, so welcoming um, from day one. You know, they treat me as though I played here the past two seasons, uh, which is amazing. You know, there's no egos within the locker room. And the culture is pretty incredible considering, you know, we're professional athletes and uh, it's a competitive sport and competitive positions and fighting for places. But a lot of the guys do treat each other like brothers, like a family. Yeah, that's really great to hear. We've heard mm -hmm. enough people say that at this point that yeah. it's not a thing I'd really thought of, but it must not be that way everywhere. No, but, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, pe people are fighting to put put food on the table so i mm -hmm. can imagine it gets competitive in the locker room as well mm -hmm. oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. but you know everybody have a good head on their shoulders here in this locker room and you know when you go out on the field and train and you still compete and you fight but at the same time you do understand and realize like hey that's my brother and if his name is selected i'm going to support him and if my name is selected they're going to support me so looking back, you mentioned your time in Columbus with Wolf. You won MLS Cup there, not with Wolf, but like in Columbus. You won MLS Cup with the Galaxy as well. What, mm -hmm. is, what does it take for a team to do that? Like what are the ingredients necessary? Have, have you noticed trends or like things that, that you think a team needs to have in place in order to go that far? 100%. Um, at least from my own opinion, I felt like that 2014 Galaxy team was a close team. Everybody in the locker room was close. You know, a lot of different names was called during different times of the year, but the veteran players would lift up the younger players because I was one of the younger ones. They would lift us up and treat us as though we were one. You know, they wouldn't treat us as a young player when we stepped foot on that field when it came to 11 guys against a different team. And I noticed that with that 2020 Columbus team, um, COVID was a weird year, but it brought a lot of, a lot of us together. 
you know, especially how the season panned out. We're away from our families in Orlando together. You can't leave. You're in this bubble. And all you have are the guys around you that you see on a day-to-day basis, which that bond and relationship became strong, similar to the Galaxy team. And next thing you know, we're out the bubble and we finish out the season. And it, here comes the final and two of our best players catch COVID and younger guys have to step up and fill those roles. And we embrace them and, you know, we take them into our arms like they're one of the vets and we go on to beat Seattle and it's the same, you know, feeling and vibes in this locker room. There's no egos. Everybody's close together. And even with some of the younger guys, the older vets are bringing them in like, Hey, yeah, you may be confused on our system or our style of play, but listen, this is the pass you have to make. This is the run you have to make. This is the option that's open. So I'm already seeing characteristics of those two previous teams that I've won championships with here in this locker room. And I've only been here um, since, what, January or something? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. that's, that's incredible. So where do you see – I mean, you have, like, vocal leaders. You have silent leaders. You have people who lead by example. Like, where do you see yourself fitting in with this group as, in terms of what you contribute to the culture and chemistry? Yeah, so I, I always say, man, I, I'm I'm a guy who lead by example. Um, I would rather show than you know the ya 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 and and use my voice um, because I know that if somebody sees me working extremely hard or doing certain things, I think you feed off that that visually and also that energy. Like, oh, he's doing that. I gotta do it. I gotta do it. You know, or vice versa. If I see somebody else working their butt off to go track down a, a ball that you know the team just lost. I'm like, oh, he's making that run defensively. I got to go do it, you know? So I like to just lead by example and um, and not say much, but you can see based on my actions. So we don't want to take up too much of your time, but one mm-hmm. last question that I wanted to get into with you is about your role on the field. So mm-hmm. you are, um, I would say as far as like public opinion, like somewhat of a divisive striker. I think there's like certain types of people will criticize certain things about your game, but I think there's, this other subset of people who can maybe see this other layer of your game that's not always necessarily obvious. And I think Mm -hmm. one of those things is like data people specifically will look at your game and be like, Jossie Zardes is an extremely efficient striker. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as like the, like the, those data minded people talking about, like, it's not about how many chances you finish. It's about how many, how many times you can get in a position to get a chance to finish. Mm -hmm. are you able to like do you engage with the game on that kind of level or do you think about it in kind of a more like organic human way like do you think about like the data or like take in that data and and use that to affect your game yeah no so it's it's uh it's different from my perspective um just because there's a like you said there's a bunch of people that um hate on me just to hate on me you know then you have those people who are like data driven like oh here go the numbers here it is. And then you have some of the guys like, oh, um, that formation fits him or such and such, you know. So for myself, it's it comes down to the coaches I work with um, because I talk to a lot of them as far as critiquing video, you know, um, from training sessions and also from games. Because for myself, depending on what team I play on or play with, I'm watching film on the style and the areas and the positions that I need to be in so that when I have that opportunity, I can vary it. Because on certain teams, there's been some spells where I'll go three games and I might have one shot or two shots, you know? So it's like, I have to make it count. So that's why I'll analyze the video clips and see like, okay, if I'm not getting the ball a lot based on the way we're playing, I know if I go here, I'll have an opportunity to score this goal, you know? so. That's the way I view it. Um, but the data is always at the end of the year. Like you look at, all right, what opportunities are you getting? What positions? What are the hot zones? That's when you use data to to the video as well. Like, okay, in this area, like for example, last year, I think uh, Austin scored 69 goals. And then we'll look at the data like, okay, what were the hot zones? Uh, what's the percentage we scored in that area? And then I'll go back and look at that area and look at certain runs, uh, certain defenders, how they're defending that area to where when we play certain teams, I'll know, hey, that's the area that that's the hot spot where we score. So I'm going to go try to manipulate that area and try to at least have one opportunity. And I just need to make sure I bury it. 
you know? Yeah, I, I love that. It reminds me of a quote that I, I like to bring up a lot from, I think it was from Gary Lineker talking about like when a ball falls to him, like in the box and he finishes it, people will say like, mm -hmm. oh, he's in, he's in the right place at the right time. And he's like, no, no, mm -hmm. I'm in the right place every time. And sometimes yes. the ball gets mm -hmm. there and sometimes it doesn't, but I make sure to be in the right place every time. So when the ball does fall to me, I'm there to finish it. And like, yeah. I love that, like that thought process. It's the thing that a lot of people don't, don't think about or don't notice when they're watching a game. Exactly, man. And I, I love the fact that you brought up that quote because a lot of people sometimes will watch my game and be like, oh, he's an in the box striker, like a uh, poacher or tapping. But it's exactly what you said. You know, I watch, I watch a ton of film. I, I know where to be. And for me, I love learning from strikers that are my teammates. You know, like in the past, a, a great guy that I obviously watched, obviously, is Robbie King growing up, um, but also playing alongside of him, watching him, how he don't necessarily have to use his speed, but his body faint and body movement. Um, a great guy in the box as well, um, Josie Altidore, how, how he used his body. You know, he's strong and big. I'm a big presence, um, and I need to use my body more. I try to use it his way. Um, a great guy too, man, uh, Bradley Wright Phillips. If you ever see him in the box, he, and that's another one. I used to be like, man, in training, I'd be like, how is he getting that opportunity? When I go in there, I'm not getting that same opportunity. But you see, he's at the right place because he knows where to be. So it's the same here, man. I'm watching Maxi. I'm watching Will um, during training, trying to see, like, their tendencies, their habits, just so I can adapt and, and add that to my game so that, you know, I can find that easy goal. And people think it's easy, but... You guys, because we're talking now, you guys know the behind the scenes parts, you know? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that, Jossie. And yeah. I think that's all we have for you. Thanks so much for, for taking this time. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck this season. No, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to a big year.